Psalmist said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. So let's sing together about that God who protects and guards his people. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Number 196, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
Now let's pray together. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods, majestic in holiness, gracious in your steadfast love, leading your people whom you have redeemed? Our good and generous God, we thank you for all the gifts that you have showered upon us so abundantly. We thank you for loved ones, for friends, for food, for homes, and all the many blessings, noticed and unnoticed, which fill our lives. But above all, for your great love in our Lord Jesus Christ, one with you who became one of us and is one of us still. At the beginning of this week, help us not to divide Sunday and Monday, as if you were the God of Sunday, and then on Monday we are left to our own resources. Father, we thank you that you are the God of every day. Seven whole days, not one in seven. We will praise you. We pray that our faith may not be pious words and outward rituals, but a living faith which reflects the Christ who lives in us by his Spirit. Pray you'll give us listening ears, you'll give us open and generous hearts, that you will speak to us in the deep places of our persons. We pray that you will forgive our many sins. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We may truly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let me welcome you again wherever you are in the building and in particular if this is, if this is your first visit, a special welcome. Trust you will feel at home and feel blessed and strengthened by the, by, by the Word of God and as we meet around his table. Now you should have, have on your seats one of those, um, one of those um, information sheets. I'm not going to go through them all obviously, there are many things here. Um, remember the Congregational Prayer Meeting on Wednesday at 7.30. And one other notice which is not on the sheet. We're of course glad to see students returning and um, we really appreciate the presence of students and the work that's done among them. Now on Friday, Friday the 9th, this coming Friday, if anyone is free and can come to Bath Street here at 1pm, it will be great because we're going to deliver flyers to student residences which give information about student work and so on. So the, these are the notices, apart from the fact that Agnes is going to give us a notice. Thank you. You should all have on your chairs one of these. Uh, but gents, I'm sorry to disappoint you, it's not for you. I'd like to remind women in the congregation not to miss out on the first ever Scottish Women's Bible Convention on Saturday the 8th of October in Edinburgh. It's a conference, a day conference being organised jointly by the East of Scotland and the West of Scotland Gospel Partnerships. Um, I'm organising it along with a group of women uh, from churches in those partnerships and we'd love you to come along. It'll be a great day of good faithful Bible teaching by women, for women, but not all about women. It's going to be about the Lord Jesus and how we can keep our eyes fixed on him and how we can keep on running the race. Um, some questions have been asked about it. Is it just for women in ministry like you and Katie? No. If you're, if you're here, then it's for you, unless you're a man. Simples. Um, is it just for oldies? Nobody actually said that but sometimes that's what they mean. Is it just for oldies? No. Is it just for the young ones? No. Whether you've got a young Scott card or a bus pass, or you're anywhere in between those two, uh, you're very welcome. I genuinely think you would have a great day if you came. 
I really think so. Make a day out to Edinburgh to be encouraged in your faith. I can't think of anything better to do. Um, You need to book online, but if you really can't find a niece or a nephew or a grandson or a granddaughter to do that for you, then if you give me a tenor in your name, I'll happily book you in online. I promise I won't just spend it on chips. Uh, So please come and join the 300 plus who've already booked, and I can't guarantee that the other 200 places will still be there for much longer. Uh, Thank you very much, Agnes. The women do get all the fun, don't they? Um, I'm sure men, I mean, there are a few things more boring than men's conferences, but uh, there, there you go. A few things better than a women's one. <laughs> <laughs> Hope so. Anyway, we're going to turn out our Bible reading, which you'll find on page 573, if you're using the church Bibles. Over the last weeks, we've started a study in this great prophet, the prophet Isaiah, And we've seen how in difficult, dangerous times, he has proclaimed a message of hope. A message of hope that's going to culminate in the coming of a child called Emmanuel, who is going to come from the line of David, and who is going to rule not just in Israel, but going to rule over the whole world. Now this passage we're reading today is a long passage. We're going to read chapter 9, verse 8 to 1034. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I'll read a large part of it. And remember Isaiah's living living in threatening times. The great Assyrian Empire up there on the Tigris is is becoming more and more belligerent, gobbling up all the nations. And Isaiah is warning his people of the dangers of disobedience and the safety that lies in trusting the Lord. That's the underlying theme of this passage. So... Chapter 9, verse 8, page 573. Prophet writes, The Lord has sent a word against Jacob, and it will fall on Israel, and all the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and in arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen, but we will build with the rest stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. But the Lord raises the adversaries of Rezin, that's the king of Syria, against him and stirs up his enemies. The Syrians on the east and the Philistines on the west devour Israel with open mouth. For all that, his anger has not turned away and his hand is stretched out still. It continues in that vein where the prophet says, you've been disobedient and because because you've been disobedient, you're in mortal danger. Now you come down to chapter 10 verse 5 on the following page it's not just God's people who are going to be judged it's the Assyrian oppressor chapter 10 verse 8 ah Assyria the rod of my anger the staff in their hands is my fury against the godless nation I sent him and against the the people of my wrath I command him to take spoil and seize plunder and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. But he does not so intend. His heart does not think so. It is in his heart to destroy and cut down nations, not a few. For he says, are not my commanders all kings? Is not Kalno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols, as I have done to Samaria and her idols? When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes, for he, that's the king of Assyria, says, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, For I have understanding. I remove the boundaries of people and plunder their treasures. Like a bull, I bring down those who sit on thrones. My hand has found a nest, the wealth of these peoples, as one gathers eggs that have been forsaken. So I have gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved a wing or opened the mouth or chirped. Shall the axe boast over him who hews with it, or the saw magnify itself against him who wields it, as if a rod 
should wield him who lifts it, or as if a staff should lift him who is not wood. Therefore the Lord God of hosts will send wasting sickness among his stout warriors, and under his glory a burning will be kindled, the burning of fire. The light of Israel will become a fire, and his holy one a flame, and it will burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. The glory of his forest and of his fruitful land the Lord will destroy both soul and body. It will be as when a sick man wastes away. The remnant of the trees of his forest will be so few that a child can write them down. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God, for though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of all the earth. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrians when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. In a very little while, my fury will come to an end, and my anger will be directed to their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will wield against them a whip, as when he struck Midian at the rock of Oreb. And his staff will be over the sea, and he will lift it as he did in Egypt. And in that day, his burden will depart from your shoulder, and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be broken because of the fat. Now a passage describes the terrifying approach of the Assyrian army. He has come to Ayath. He passes through Migron. At Michmash he stores his baggage. They have crossed over the pass. At Geba they lodge for the night. Ramah trembles. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Cry aloud, O daughter of Galim. Give attention to Elisha. O poor Anathoth. Madmanah is in flight. The inhabitants of Gebim flee for safety. This very day he will halt at Nob. He will shake his fist at the mountain of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold, the Lord God of hosts will lop the boughs with terrifying power. The great in height will be hewn down, and the lofty will be brought low. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an axe, and Lebanon will fall by the majestic one. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Now we are going to have a short break as the musicians play and we take up our offering for the Lord's work.
Well, let's pray. Apostle Paul wrote, You know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. Father, we pray that the gifts have been given, other gifts in, in the bank and in various trusts and so on, that these may be used for the glory of Christ's name and for the building up of his kingdom and for the establishing of the many gospel partnerships with which we're involved. This morning we want to pray for our partners for this month, the Roberies, David and Julie, and their daughters, Rebecca, Elizabeth, Abigail, and Helen, they are ser who are serving in Josh, Nigeria, of the Wycliffe Bible Translators. Father, we pray for their safety. We know that is a volatile and um, difficult part of the world. We pray for their safety. Pray for Julie as she, as she educates the children at home. Pray she'll be given strength and, and um, ability and imagination to carry out this exacting task. And we pray for David as he works in the translation. And we thank you, Lord, for all those efforts all over the world to bring the word of God to people, to shine the light into the darkness, and to give people who live in darkness the light shining upon them. And so, Father, as we, as we thank you for this, and as we pray, Lord, for your work in the world, we ask that you'll give to us truly thankful and grateful hearts, and that you will bless us as we are met together to listen to your word and to meet around your table. And we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now that passage we read has a great deal to do with the ignoring of the word of God. And we're going to sing now one of Charles Wesley's hymns. This is one of his better known hymns, number 555. There's a very powerful hymn, Lord God, who breathed your word of old on those who wrote the sacred page, the same through all the years untold to us in our degenerate age, the spirit of your word impart and breathe his life into our heart. Number 555.
Now, if, please, we could have our Bibles open, that passage we read, and we'll have a moment of prayer. And Father, we ask that your gracious Holy Spirit, who inspired these words, will now speak them to our hearts, so that what we hear is not simply the voice of Isaiah in the 8th century B.C., but the voice of the Lord speaking not only then, but speaking now to us in our day and speaking that same word to challenge, to encourage, and to lead us on in our Christian pathway. We ask this in the name of him who is the living word, the Lord Christ himself. Amen. Some of you may have visited the Assyrian rooms in the British Museum. If you haven't and you're ever down that way, they are most certainly worth a visit. The whole museum is, but the Assyrian rooms are especially impressive. Thelma and I visited there last summer, and we went to to these rooms. Now, as you go into the rooms, there are two gigantic sculptures from one of the ancient Assyrian cities. Gigantic bull-shaped figures with a man's head, the head of one of the Assyrian kings. Now, in, even in the sanitized surroundings of a 21st century museum, these, these figures are awesome and terrifying. And when they were looked upon by the races, the nations whom the Assyrians subdued, they must have been absolutely intimidating and terrifying. As I was well aware of this, in chapter... In chapter 10, the chapter we read, in chapter 10, verse 13, he says this, The Assyrian king brags, I remove the boundaries of peoples and plunder their treasures. Like a bull, I bring down those who sit on thrones. The Assyrian menace, the the terrible the, the terrible and frightening power of this super state, which was, which was grabbing up the little communities throughout the Middle East. And the first thing I want to say is this, that Isaiah lived in dangerous times, in confusing times. So do we. Our personal lives are often a muddle, aren't they? The communities we belong to, the fellowships we are part of, are very often confused and perplexed and can't quite see the way ahead. That's even before we get to the national and international scene. Think of the continuing powder keg in the Middle East, the Islamic State. Think of the world powers circling each other uneasily. I read a book some time ago called The World in a Hundred Years, which addressed that kind of issue and talked particularly of the growing power of China and predicted that China and Mexico would be the greatest powers in a hundred years. None of us here, not even the youngest, are probably going to be around to know whether that prediction was right. Think of the turmoil in our own politics. It's just over two months ago that the country voted to leave the European Union and we have no idea how that's going to work out. Now, not make a political point. Obviously, we all had our own ideas on that. We all voted, and I'm sure, and, 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 uh, and I'm sure we voted in the way we thought was right. Think of the turmoil in the Labour Party. Think of the American presidency and all, and all the, that will hold for the future of the world. The growing um, demand again for independence in Scotland. Do we have a God who is big enough to handle this? Can we, my title today is Making Sense of History. Can we make sense of history? How are we going to navigate our way through these quicksands and shoals and reefs? Now, Isaiah's God is the God who makes sense of history. He speaks. He sends a word, chapter 9, verse 8, the first verse we read. He sends a word, and he acts in the world. 
And later on in the book, in chapter 1, God, the God of Israel, Yahweh God of Israel, is going to summon the gods of the nations. And he's going to ask them the questions about history. He says, do you know what happened in the past? Not just can you give an account of events. Anyone can do that if they read it up. Can you make sense of it? Can you make sense of how we are now in the present? Can you foretell the future? Now, the point about Isaiah's God is he is the Lord of history, the Lord of time, the Lord, and he knows what will happen because he has planned what will happen. And that is why the key to living in this perplexing world is faith. As Isaiah has said to the godless King Ahaz back in chapter 7, if you do not stand firm in faith, you will not stand at all. Because the world is perplexing. None of us know what is going to happen. Now, very often, as we expound passages, but more often than not, say in narrative, we'll go through the sequence of events, see how the plot develops. Or in a letter, for example, see the development of the argument. This chapter, this, this passage we read across the chapter is a very powerful poetic passage full of vivid imagery. And what I'm going to try to do is to disentangle two intertwining themes in this passage. Both of them are related to the word of God. Both of them are related to God's control of history. And that word, if ignored or disobeyed, will mean that the tangle of events becomes even more perplexing. But if that word is listened to, as Peter says in his second letter, it will be a light in a dark place, in a confusing, murky, puzzling place. And the first thing I want to look at is disobedience brings judgment. That's essentially what Wesley was saying in the hymn we sang. It's a fine hymn. It's not sung as often as some of the others, but it's a very powerful, penetrating hymn. He sends his word, chapter 9, verse 8. In chapter 9, verse 13, the people did not inquire of the Lord. And of course, how do we inquire of the Lord? We inquire of the Lord by listening to what he has to say to us. There's no point in saying we're trying to discover the Lord's will and then ignoring the scriptures, which is what many people do nowadays, or we don't know what the Spirit is saying to us. Of course we don't know what the Spirit is saying to us if we ignore the word that the Spirit Spirit has given. He tells them in 1020 to lean on the Holy One in truth. So this is about God has sent a word, and God has sent us a word. A far more complete word than ancient Israel had. After all, uh, a great deal of the scripture had still been written when Isaiah spoke. And this word is about the relationship of disobedience and judgment. Now, I'm sure something that must occur to us when we read the scriptures, why is there so much judgment? Particularly read a prophet like Isaiah. That's why, of course, we love the passages, and rightly, like we read last week, the child with four names, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I think we dislike judgment because deep down we associate it with judgmentalism, which is a very different thing. Disapproving self-righteousness and legalism. Now, that's a very, very different thing. That's what marked the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes uh, during Jesus' earthly life. What we've got to remember is this prophet is not standing, denouncing and saying, you'll get what's coming to you. Remember in the great vision back in chapter 6, he had said, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. Those the prophet said, I'm under judgment as well. And all of us, particularly those of us I think who teach and preach, must remember this, that we are under judgment as well. Because we'll only ever speak of judgment without judgmentalism if we realize that. And the other thing is judgment always follows the rejection of God's gracious word. Like everything else, going back to the beginning of the Bible, back in Genesis 3, God graciously provided every tree in the garden. 
everything that could, Adam and Eve could possibly need. And what does Eve do? She turns it into a bullying negative. The Lord said, you must not eat of that tree or even touch it. Now, the word touch it, of course, was, was simply an addition. The Lord is nothing whatever about touching it. But you see, what, see what's happening there? That um, instead of rejoicing in God's gracious provision, we pick out the negatives. I've seen a children's talk done sometimes where the speaker holds up a white sheet which has a, black, a small black mark in it and say, what do you see? Now, you'll always get some smart aleck. You'll give the wrong answer, but um, the right answer, rather. But the, the point is, almost everybody will say, oh, I see a black mark. The whole the of the white sheet is spoiled for them by the black mark. And so often that's the case with the word of God, isn't it? We ignore the gracious provision. We ignore the fact that the Lord, as Moses, uh, as rather Lord said to Moses, the Lord, gracious, slow to anger, keeping steadfast love and showing mercy to thousands who obey him. And that is the point here. This is the God of steadfast love whose word they had rejected. And the picture of fire in verse 18 of um, chapter 9. Wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It kindles the thickets of the forest and they roll upward in a column of smoke. In other words, disobedience breeds disobedience. Sin breeds sin. But notice verse 18. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts, the land is scorched. People commit sin. People reject the Lord and the Lord underwrites that. Very interesting in the flood story. The Lord says, humanity has become totally corrupt, therefore I will destroy it. Now in Hebrew, these words are forms of the same verb. Humanity is totally self-destructed, so I will destroy it. In Romans 1, the terrible divine hands off. God gave them over. Disobedience brings judgment, and disobedience shows itself in arrogance and self-sufficiency. And that's the case both in Israel and in Assyria. Chapter 9, verse, um, verse um, 9. All the people know Ephraim, the inhabitants of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen. Let me refer to the great earthquake that's mentioned by the prophet Amos. Amos, who prophesied just a few years earlier, and we are told two years before the earthquake. What are they going to do? Oh, our house is destroyed. We'll build even more spectacular ones. But it also may be a metaphor of the world falling apart and the blindness where they, where they say, they will, we don't care what God's done. We'll just keep on building, even if it's, even if it's shoddy building. And then in 1013, the Assyrian boast will come back to this, the... The, 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 the strength of my hand, I have done it by my wisdom, I have understanding, and I plunder their treasures. The verse I refer to Ray like a bull brings down those who sit on their throne. Once again, it's back to Genesis 3, isn't it? You will be like God. That is the human pride and arrogance. It's shown, of course, in the builders of the Tower of Babel. Let us build a tower whose top will reach to heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves. The self-confidence that will not trust in the Lord, will not obey his word. Very near the end of the book, the Lord is to say to Isaiah, this is the one to whom I will look, to the one who is humble and who trembles at my word. I don't think we tremble enough at the word of the Lord. On my bookshelf in my study, I have a book which is called Trembling on the Threshold of the Word of God. Every time I preach or, or share the Word of God, I remember that. Trembling on the threshold. This is something that is terrifying. Arrogance, bad leadership. Verses 9 to chapter 9 again, verse 13. This is what you get when you get leaders who do not tremble at the word of God. The people did not turn to him who struck them, nor inquire of the Lord of hosts. The Lord cut off Israel, from Israel head and tail, palm branch and reed, in one day. In particular, chapter, the, 
verse 15, the prophet who teaches lies. Very interesting, very often in Scripture, prophet is a term of condemnation and abuse. In Jeremiah, for example, the word prophet occurs 200 times, or over 200 times. Almost always it's a false prophet. Because these prophets, like the super apostles whom Paul confronted in the church in Corinth, were leading astray and they were modeling arrogance and bullying. They were not servant leaders. They were arrogant. They were, they were malicious. And they identified their own opinions with God's word. The Lord told me to say this, that kind of thing. It's difficult when people say that, isn't it? What are you supposed to say? I believe what the Lord told us to do is this. Like those guys who get up to preach and say, I never prepare. I just get up and say what the Lord tells me to say. My experience with such people is the Lord never tells them when to stop. Um, we need to remember. I mean, I often think of the words of Cromwell to some of the more, some of the more um, bigoted Scottish leaders. I beseech you, by the mercies of Christ, consider that you may be mistaken. It's useful for us to remember that. There is only one authoritative word. That's the word that must be spoken. So arrogance, self-sufficiency, bad leadership, um, and then conflict and division. Here we have down in um, verse, um, verse 21, Manasseh devours Ephraim and Ephraim devours Manasseh. Now these were the two main tribes in the northern kingdom. These were, and they were fighting and biting and devouring. As Paul says, as Paul warns, if you bite and devour one another, you will be consumed by one another. And then they turn on Judah. You see the connection of this with disobeying God's word and arrogance. You see, if I disobey God's word and exalt my own opinions, then obviously I'm going to feel that um, I am right and everybody else is wrong. And when self is exalted, Christ is always um, Christ is always dethroned. Um, like at the end of Second Corinthians, um, Paul and the super apostles, and Paul tells them in Second Corinthians thirteen, you don't understand Christ. Your argument's not with me, but with Christ. You don't understand the cross. You don't understand the way of servant leadership. And you don't understand the resurrection. You haven't made it already. You're, over, you're still in this world. See, we need to see this. We need to see that disobedience to God's word leads to judgment. Whether it's among God's people or in the world. And we need to look beyond the tangle of events to the Lord of history None of us know what's going to happen over the next years, either in our own personal lives, our own lives of our own fellowship, lives of our nation, the life of the world. That is why, if we do not stand firm in faith, we will not stand at all. Now, that's the first theme that goes through the passage. Both God's people and the Assyrians are judged for disobedience. But the second thing is, judgment is under God's control. Once again, back to the first verse we read, the Lord has sent a word. And when the Lord sends a word, that shows he is at work. How did God create the world? God said, let there be light. God said, and, and it was. His word is active and living. Isaiah is going to develop that in the great 55th chapter, the word that comes down from heaven and works unseen under the earth and causes transformation, personal, com communal, and indeed the whole, the whole of creation. But there is a huge problem problem also identified later by Habakkuk on the brink of the exile. God's people are godless and disobedient. But why raise up an even more godless nation to punish them? Verse 5 of chapter 10, uh, Assyria, the rod of my anger. God is using Assyria as a club, as a rod to beat his own people. And why on earth is this happening? 
it's a puzzle, and it's a great, and it's, it's, there's no easy answers. But look at verse 12. When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will punish the speech of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes. In other words, it's not actually the Assyrian who is judging them. It is the Lord himself. And that is terrifying, of course. But always throughout Scripture, particularly in these prophets who are looking to the exile and the prophets of the exile, they look beyond exile to return. When the Lord has finished his work. Not when the Assyrians have... um, have finished their work, and the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion. And notice it's still Mount Zion. Very interesting with Daniel. Daniel opens his windows to Jerusalem. Now, at that moment, Jerusalem is a smoking ruin. Je- uh, the Book of Lamentation said jackals prowling over it, weeds all over the place. Um, Ezra had not, the pioneers had not yet returned. It was long before Ezra and Nehemiah would come and so on. But it's still God's city. And what's, what's this about then? First of all, the Assyrian has a wrong view of history. Remember our subject, making sense of history. The Assyrian view of history is that might is right that the biggest bully always wins. And uh, look at verse um, verse 7 of chapter 10. He does not so intend. His heart does not so think. It is in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. For he says, are my commanders all kings? The towns mentioned here are the Syrian towns, which had already fallen to to the Assyrian advance. It's a supreme example of pride. You see, the Assyrian kings think they are gods. Verse 10, my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images were greater than those of Jerusalem and of Samaria. In other words, I've smashed the gods of Syria, and your gods are not even as good as they are. So I'm going to, I'm going to smash them as well. You're not so accomplished idolaters as the Syrians are. But verse 12 shows that This arrogant power is subject to a supreme power. They think they're in control, but God has his purpose. It's very like what Joseph said to his brothers. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The Assyrians meant it for evil. They were bent on conquest, on world dominion, whereas God has his holy purpose to cleanse his people from sin and to restore Zion. The Assyrians are not going to rule the world after all. What is it said back in just a few verses before? The increase of his government, the child with four names, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it from this time forth and forevermore. So the Assyrians have the wrong view of history. History, the biggest bully wins. Might is right kind of things that Hitler said to the oppressed nations during the Second World War. The Reich will last for a thousand years. When Hitler said that, it had less than three years to run. That is the point. The the wrong view of history is that might is right, that the bullies win, that evil triumphs. But the remnant shows God's good purposes. Um... Remember, this is a theme that's run through the prophet, the idea of the remnant, Emmanuel, who will come to and from the remnant. And in chapter 10, verse 21, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. The mighty God, God the warrior, that's one of the names given to the child in, in, in the previous chapter. And once again, God is going to destroy his enemies. Um, Verse 25, lift up the staff as as the Egyptians did. Going back to the Exodus story, the Lord told Moses to to stretch out his staff across the sea. And and the story once again, 
which is referred to in chapter 9, the story of Gideon and God overthrowing his enemies. My people will dwell, my people who dwell in Zion. And that's a, that's a, what you might call a present continuous sense, the people who dwell in Zion. Assyria will go the way of Egypt. You see, in the ancient world, it was widely believed that a, na- a conquered nation, the gods were conquered as well. And that explains the Exodus 12, where God says, I will pass through Egypt tonight, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will carry out judgment. The great problem of the exile was, is the Lord, Yahweh, weaker than the gods of Babylon. That's the point of Daniel and Ezekiel and the other prophets of the exile. Where is God in exile? He's in the blazing furnace and lion's den along with his people and will bring them back. His anger is brief, but his mercy is everlasting. Verse 25, in a very little while my fury will come to an end. My anger will be directed to their destruction. The fury against his people and the anger then directed at the Assyrian and later the Babylonian and, and the other oppressors. But Assyria is still terrifying. We mustn't take all this to mean that we ought to be complacent and look out of the world and shrug our shoulders and say, oh, well, it's all going to work out. We need to realize that we still need protection. And we have a powerful picture here in verses 26 to 32 of the terrifying Assyrian invasion. This is probably not the invasion mentioned later on in the time of Hezekiah, because at that time Sennacherib of Assyria approached Jerusalem from the south. It may well be that when the northern kingdom was conquered and Samaria fell, the Assyrians sent a raiding party down down to Jerusalem. That's perfectly possible. These names he has come to Ayath, probably the, the town of Ai in Joshua, which was destroyed by Joshua, but later later rebuilt, and only about twenty miles north of Jerusalem, uh, Michmash, a pass where the invader might have been stopped. And in the days of David, read in one Samuel fourteen of how Jonathan, David's friend, defeated the Philistines in that very pass. But he's not being stopped there. Verses 29 to 31, key towns on the road to Jerusalem and Nob, just one mile north of the city, shaking the fist, literally shaking the milled fist. That's terrifying. And that's why the last two verses, 33 and 34, which are going to lead directly into chapter 11 that we'll look at next week. The Lord God of hosts will lop the boughs with terrifying power. Zion will be saved, but the great trees, the Assyrian menace, will be lopped down. But there is a tree that's not going to be cut down, as we'll, as we'll see next week. Disobedience brings judgment. But the Lord is in charge of that judgment. And Zion, the city of our God, still remains. That sort of lies behind, we read from Psalm 46 at the beginning, probably a psalm reflecting the, the, the rescue of Jerusalem. Lord God will come to her help early in the morning. And Psalm 40, walk about Zion, tell her palaces that you may tell to the generation following that this God is our God. Zion stands, and that is what makes sense of history. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in this difficult, perplexing, and confusing world, we pray that we may indeed trust in the Lord, that we may indeed stand firm in faith, that we may look beyond the terrifying power of events and circumstances, and that we may indeed trust in the one who one day will reign over the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and to uphold it. And we give you our thanks for this. In his name. Amen.
Now as we come around the Lord's table, we are going to sing, we're going to sing number um, 566. As we come to the Lord, we need to remember who the Lord is. And this hymn uses Isaiah's favourite term for the Lord, be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Number 566. we come around the Lord's table, remind ourselves that this is the table of the Lord himself. It's not our table, and all who love the Lord Jesus Christ are welcome to share with us in the bread and wine. If you'd rather not take the bread and wine, please don't feel in any way embarrassed. Just pass it to the the person next to you. I want to begin by reading some verses from the book of Revelation. At another time of turmoil, another time of um, great uncertainty, the Apostle John writes this. I, John, your brother and partner, in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, The hairs of his head were white, like white wool. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, 
and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of the world to come. And as John sees this glorious figure, this is not Christ as he remembers him in his earthly life, not even Christ as he will be, but Christ as he is now, holding his people in his hand, walking among them and assuring them that he not only holds the keys of death, but the keys of the world beyond. And that's the one whose table we gather around and whom we remember. So let's pray. Almighty God, we praise and worship you that in your goodness you have revealed yourself to us, made us your children, and invited us to your own table. We do not come to this table because we deserve to, but we come because we are your children, loved and accepted into your family. We thank you for the prophecies which tell us about his coming. The child with four names, Emmanuel, who one day will reign over the whole world. We praise you for his birth in great humility, for his life on earth and the overthrow of the kingdom of darkness, for his death, for his resurrection and ascension, for his sending of the Spirit and for the sure and certain hope that he will come again in his glorious majesty. And today we meet around his table. We look back to Calvary and we thank you for that one sacrifice which can never be repeated and to which nothing can be added. And we thank you that in our fickleness and vulnerability we have, do not have a great high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And so, as we meet as your children, joining not only with those here in this building, but with all your people across the world, through time and space, and we pray that you will fill our hearts with thankfulness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. All of you eat it. In the same way, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. All of you drink it. And the Apostle Paul tells us that this is food for the road, that as often as we proclaim, as we proclaim the Lord's death, we look forward to his coming again. So, brothers and sisters, eat and drink, not because we must, but because we may. Not because we are strong, but because we are weak. Eat and drink because we love the Lord a little and want to love him more. But above all, let us eat and drink because he loves us and gave himself for us. Now, our custom here is when we receive the bread, we'll eat it. But if you would, when you receive the cup, if you would keep it and we'll all drink together.
And let's drink together, remembering that Christ has died, Christ is risen, that Christ will come again. Let's pray. The risen Lord appeared among his disciples and showed them his hands and side. And then the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of sitting around your table. Many of us have sat around your table many times. Perhaps some much more recently, perhaps even someone for the first time. And we thank you too for those who once sat around your table on earth and now rejoice at your table in the heavenly Zion. And we, we pray, Lord, that as we continue our journey to Zion, that you will indeed travel with us and that you will richly bless us. Amen. Now, just before we sing our last hymn, I would very much like on our behalf to welcome Scott and Nock Murray uh, back from Thailand. I thought I saw you earlier in the service, but I wasn't sure. And, well, it's very embarrassing not to welcome people who are here. It's even more embarrassing to welcome people who are not here. But <laughs> both of you are very, very welcome, and um, we're very we're delighted to see you and trust your time with us um, will be a a time of great blessing to you. So let's sing our final hymn now, which is number 192, O Lord our God, how majestic is your name, the earth is filled with your glory, we will magnify the Lord enthroned in Zion.
farewell to God our Father, whose purposes for us do not end in death, to our Lord Jesus Christ, who entered our world, that we might enter his, and to the Holy Spirit, who continually works in our hearts, preparing us for that great day, be all honour, glory, and love. May they walk with us and bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory. Amen.